Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. I am Miss Angler and this is my prediction for Paper 2 Life Sciences 2021. Now if you're new here, don't forget to click the like button, subscribe and turn your notifications on because I post a new video every Thursday. I'd like to preface all of my predictions are of course my own, based off of my own teaching experience, my knowledge around the subject, my general expectations and also the fact that I do matric marking at the end of the year so I got a pretty good idea of what they're going to probably ask you. Most of these predictions are based off of patterns but also the sequence of how often they ask these kinds of questions. So let's get into question one, the multiple choice section. I'm seeing a very strong pattern coming across when you look at the previous year's papers that a heavy emphasis on genetics is found in the multiple choice section. Now, that does mean that you need to be quite quick on your feet because it means you might have to be able to calculate some genetic crosses. You might have to calculate some percentages or ratios. And they often like to ask these sort of standard genetic questions in the multiple choice section. I've also noticed very regularly that in the multiple choice section, they have had a lot of data response questions, which means they give you a graph or they give you a table of some kind and they want you to interpret it. Generally, they say that question, which is the hardest question in the multiple choice section for right at the end. Let's get into terminology. Now, terminology can be a dangerous place for people who haven't studied enough. Now, some common terminology that I'm seeing a lot is punctuated equilibrium, uh, ribose sugars, peptide bond, hydrogen bond, often we get those two confused. Basically, the terminology section in paper two often has terms that are confused with one another. In other words, people often get, for example, centriole and centromere confused or centrosome. And they want to know if you can actually tell the difference between them. So that's where it comes out in the terminology section. The next thing that is always going to be in question one is a meiosis question. Now, I'd like to remind you that they've taken meiosis out of paper one and they've only included it in paper two. So what can you expect for the meiosis question? Generally, they like to ask things around crossing over or identifying the phase that you can see in the diagram or, and this is where they like to get quite tricky, they want to see whether or not you know what is the phase before the one in the picture or the one after that's in the picture. So in other words, you actually need to know not only what phase you're looking at, but what phase comes before and after. And sometimes that's where that continuous accuracy catches up with you because if you misidentify it, you won't know what comes before or after it. Now, another very common part of meiosis is questions around the chromosome number. Please be very careful of these questions. And the final question that I can guarantee will be in this paper and probably in question one is the dye hybrid cross. This is actually a fearful question a lot of people have because dye hybrids can be quite intimidating. However, what they're actually asking you to do is to fill in the missing pieces of information. Now, it is in question one, so you would think it would be easy, but often this is the question we spend a lot of time on. And it's a very worthwhile question to get a lot of easy marks, but take your time with this question because often it is where the mistakes are made. And if you make the mistake early on in this question, you carry the error all the way through your answers, but there will definitely be a dihybrid question. You won't have to calculate a whole 16 block Punnett square, but you'll have to fill in the missing information. Going into question two, there will most definitely be a monohybrid cross. Now, what they're going to ask you to cross, I don't know. Every year it changes. It could be anything from perhaps a disorder. It could be just a characteristic like black and white, red and white. It could be anything. But I can guarantee you in question two, there will be some kind of genetic cross. In other words, a monohybrid cross with the Punnett square that you will have to complete. Now, this is a big one, and I want everyone to pay attention on what I'm about to say. There is a new trend to include crosses and also Punnett squares with co-dominance and incomplete dominance. 
If you have been practicing past papers, you will have noticed that this has been coming up recently, but it has become very, very popular over the last two years. If you do papers that are older than the last two years, you'll notice that there isn't any questions on co-dominance or incomplete dominance. And that is because the trend is now to go towards doing those crosses. That means you have to be well versed in those laws, you have to know how to calculate them, and you may even be asked to do a Punnett square on them. Now the last and final thing that I'm going to expect in question two is a pedigree diagram with the family tree and you have to figure out who is who and what they have. I think that they are going to use an unknown disease this year and here's the tricky sneaky part about it. They can also ask you any disorder that is recessive which we are used to, hemophilia, but they can also ask you dominant disorders. And that is often a tricky, sneaky question that they throw in every now and then to catch you out and to see whether or not you can actually do a pedigree diagram. Now, finally, let's get into question three predictions. Now, question three is notorious for being the hardest part of paper two. And I suggest that you take your time on question three. Now, I can guarantee in question three, there is going to be a human evolution question. That particular question is going to take the format of two kinds. It's either going to be a skull or skeleton question. They will have skulls lined up next to each other and they're going to ask you who is who. And they're going to ask you to put them in evolutionary order. And they're going to ask for the differences or the similarities between the skeletons or the skull. They're going to say which one's bipedal, which one isn't bipedal. And you're going to need to know how to identify those things, but also to give reasons for your identifications. Along with that, you may even be asked to elaborate on what bipedalism is and how the structures of the skull support that theory. The other way they can ask this question is with phylogenetic trees. And what they do is often the tree is either lying on its side or it's upright. And they have the common ancestor at the bottom, so the oldest individual with all of the different branches, um, you know, Homo erectus, uh, Australopithecus africanus. Um, Homo sapien, you know, all of our branches, and it's got millions of years along the side, and you have to interpret the information in the data and find information on the graph or the phylogenetic tree and then give the answer. So, the next suggestion I'm going to make is be very well versed on speciation and natural selection. Let's talk about the speciation question. There will be some kind of speciation question, guaranteed. And it's going to take the format of either an animal or a group of people or individuals, all starting with one kind of characteristic, maybe their color, maybe their feathers, maybe their size, whatever it may be. And then that population gets separated by a geographical barrier, hence geographical speciation. Now, why is this a horrible question? It's a horrible question because it can be very difficult to answer if you don't know what you're doing. And often this section takes up a big chunk of the exam. Which brings me to the final question. This question is going to be based off of natural selection. Now, natural selection is a component of speciation. So you should actually be learning these two ideas at the same time. They're not separate ideas that you must learn separately. But what we're seeing in the trends of the paper is that natural selection is often being asked in an investigative way. In other words, it's like an investigation was set up about fish being put in different salt concentrations, right? And we see how nature selects which salt concentration is best suited for that group, and they thrive, and they have favorable characteristics, and they reproduce. And the ones without the favorable characteristics die and they don't reproduce and they don't pass on those genetics. And so we're often seeing that kind of overlap where you have to explain how natural selection works, but you also have to do things like reliability, validity, give the variables, what's a control, what's the aim of this experiment, and you may even be asked to draw a graph of some kind. Don't forget, they can also ask you to draw a pie chart many matrix, forget to bring a protractor and a compass for paper two. As always, everybody, if you have liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Turn your notifications on and I will see you all again soon. Bye.